Hi, and welcome. Today, we're talking with Joe Warner about cannons and gunpowder. Joe studied history in university, and he's a huge fan of the subject. In this podcast, we talk to scholars, students, academics, enthusiasts, and so many more. As you see, not all topics here are Canadian, but I am. I'm Rosie. I'm a Francophone from Canada, and this is my podcast. Time for some explosive history, eh? So, Joe, I'm really happy you're able to join us on the podcast. Yeah, my pleasure. A super interesting subject that we haven't discussed yet. So, hopefully, everybody can get a nice little information session with your passion. Did you want to present your own subject? Yeah, why not? I well, when you said, "Hey, let's do this podcast," I was thinking back to when I got my degree, and the, the really the only thing that popped into my head was the idea of these early gunpowder regimes, and they're usually called the Islamic gunpowder empires, I think because of the obvious, you know, uh, it was the Ottomans, the Mughals, and the Safavids, and they were all founded by Turkish or Persian or some kind of mix of those things, and uh, yeah, I just thought it was really interesting because, you know, usually when we talk about gunpowder, we'll either talk about the Chinese and their fireworks, or we'll talk about the Europeans. Yeah. And whether you're talking about warfare or just, you know, the invention of. And it was really, from what I understand, and again, I'm no expert, uh, it was really these guys that put it into practical use. Nobody really used it successfully for war prior to the Ottomans that I know of. So since we jumped all the way into the subject yeah. on the first bit... Um, let's move back a little bit. So you wanted to start around 1399. I was thinking maybe that made sense because I, as far as I know, that's right around the time of the siege of Constantinople, where they brought in big giant cannons to knock down the walls. And so I thought, you know, why not start there? What was interesting was they had, you know, serious cannons that they used to knock down fortifications that in the past were considered almost you know impenetrable or invincible or however you want to call it and i think that it really ushered in a new a new era of history in a way um because you know what's the point in building these elaborate walls that take forever and at an enormous cost if they don't even work anymore Mm -hmm. if people can still siege your cities yeah and obviously like in the past there was catapults and other siege engines and the walls would come down but i guess it was just how effective cannons are at it and how does a cannon generally work for anybody who's not too familiar with it i mean from my understanding you have a big solid pipe you stuff it full of gunpowder well not full but a certain (laughs) amount of gunpowder uh you know wad up some cloths and rags behind that and then stuff in the ball and uh then when you ignite the powder the ball comes out basically just a big gun and uh, I think that at that point and for probably hundreds of years after that they were all what you call breech load meaning like the same hole that the ball comes out of is where everything gets loaded okay well that's quite interesting so I'm I'm guessing there must have been lots of injuries oh I'm sure I'm sure there was lots of times where it went off when it wasn't supposed to and things like Mm -hmm. that and also if the casting of, of the cannon wasn't perfect, it could just blow up when you ignite it and just chunk some metal. Or if there was maybe a fissure from another load that they had Yeah, land. exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wear and tear cracks. They must have had quite the engineers to check them over, sometimes for safety perhaps. I mean, I'm sure they weren't just randomly blowing up these cannons. No, and I think sometimes it would be a fun surprise and other times <laughs> it would be something more expected, but... You and know, I do know they had misfires. There. I mean, that's... Definitely. Yeah, if the gunpowder was too damp or too, mm-hmm. if it was too humid. And they would light it by putting the little rag, as you said, and that that's what well, would carry it? Actually, the, the rag would be to separate the gunpowder from the ball. Um, but usually there would be a small hole in the side of the cannon, and they'd have some powder there. And then they would hold up something, a torch, to that, and it, the fire would just go So in. it's like the Bugs Bunny cartoon. Yeah, very simple. <laughs> For those of you who are our age. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be like a wick that they no. would light, but it would be, you know, basically packed with, with gunpowder. And after Constantinople, that was sort of the big first hurrah using the cannon and being able to breach in. The most famous one. The that most I can famous think of, first yeah. one, yeah. yeah. And they would carry those 
long distances, I would guess. Yeah, I mean, it mm-hmm. seems like the whole Ottoman and the other two empires that I mentioned were, they would revolve around the cannons, so the, the cannons would be like the center of the army, and when they were traveling, it would be the center of the caravan. As They're almost were. like carrying the king around in between the people. Yeah, exactly. People. He yeah. would probably hang out close to the, the cannons, even in open warfare, in other words, not not in a siege, but armies fighting armies, a lot of it centered around the, the guns and the cannons, so... You'd have the biggest guns right in the middle, smaller guns around that, protected by wagons, basically. And on the wagons, they would mount smaller cannons. And then, uh, you know, your traditional infantry would guard that. And then they'd make use of cavalry for the more mobile parts of the Mm -hmm. So they're sort of planting themselves in one location and fighting from that location. Yeah, well, and with the... um, cannons the smaller ones mounted on the carts there was some mobility but i think that's the idea the bigger the gun the slower it can move around do you have an idea how heavy all of this was even per- not loaded was I, it a few i know tons? that some soldiers had hand cannons oh, like really? the turkish the ottoman janissary they had like a hand cannon which would be you know a similar weight to a musket but a big cannon could be hundreds of pounds hundreds and so the, I'm guessing the horses were uh, very helpful in oh, dragging they, they these? they had two horses, you know, probably Ops. even like camels and things like that, depending on exactly where it was. You wouldn't want to drag them around by hand because it would just take too many people. And exhaust and them. And too slow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I guess that was their tactics where they would move around in a large group, essentially, mm-hmm. as you're describing. Oh, yeah. You know, the Ottoman army, if they were, if they were going on a big campaign, there would probably be at least 50,000 people. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I think so. And they were moving across, trying to get to a specific location at this time? Yeah, well, I think that they were just trying to expand the empire as much as possible. And in the case of Constantinople, it was kind of like, um, almost like a nail house. Like, they had expanded all around it, but there was just this one annoying tenant that wouldn't leave (laughs) kind of thing. And uh, essentially, uh, once they pushed them out, then they were able to concentrate on expanding further. The Mughals were what years I think that around the same time okay. as the Safavids really mm-hmm. got established, around 1500, they were getting established, and it was basically from northern India, and they moved south, and, and basically, as far as I remember, ran the whole Indian subcontinent for a while. The Ottoman Empire, Constantinople, is now what you call Istanbul, and it was pretty close to the western edge of it, but um, it was definitely a thorn in their side. And that, as far as I know, the Ottomans kept going into Europe, but they had limited success getting past Bosnia and what we can th- think of as Eastern Europe. They, they didn't have too much success there. And then the Safavids were in what location? That's basically Persia. And they were also using cannons around what time? Uh, as far as I know, they came in a little bit later, like around 1500. Mm-hmm. But it was very much they took the ideas that worked in the Ottoman Empire and... And they brought them over. And rolled with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I I confess I don't know too much about the differences between them, except for, you know, the basic, like, uh, the Ottomans were one type of Islam and the Safavids were another. I believe it was Sunni for the Ottomans and Shia for the the Safavids. And they were using similar technologies. Yeah, because the people were Persian, but the, like, the ruler was of Turkish ancestry, again, if I remember right. So then they're just importing these ideas and making use of their knowledge. Yeah, and uh, you know the tactics were just very effective and they just kept rolling. So you kind of had one big clump all the way from modern day Turkey all the way through India was all just these three gunpowder empires for at least a couple hundred years. So as you've mentioned, the, the gunpowder made a huge difference in territories and expansions yeah. and contractions of it. Oh, well, for sure. And it's not like there weren't empires before gunpowder, but mm-hmm. they just changed the nature of the way wars. So strongholds before. that would have been, you know, like the boroughs that were built during King Alfred's time, for example. Exactly. All then, of a sudden they're obsolete. So the Vikings would have been much better having cannons. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> probably. Yeah, yeah, probably. Because the Vikings were great at skirmishing, but they weren't that great at siege craft. Uh, so if they had a couple of really strong cannons, cannons it might have been a different story and that innovation ran into europe yeah you mean like uh, during the crusades and things like that sure, or, yeah that's probably where europeans would have first realized this because you know it was still the holy roman empire at that mm-hmm. point and you know when it fell they would have wanted to know how and why and they, they would have realized and then it. they would have said oh this is good technology maybe we should get some of <laughs> maybe we should buy some of this yeah exactly and get proper builders and proper engineers 
Well, I guess the gunpowder, they were using them also in guns. Yeah, they had guns that, from my understanding, were similar to like early muskets. You know, you, you load one shot and that's it. Mm-hmm. And then it might take you two minutes to reload it. But if everybody has their guns ready to go, you could get a really devastating volley of fire. So any kind of bow work was getting obsolete at this point? I think that there was probably a case where the, they both worked really well together. Uh, the guns were mostly on carts and in the hands of infantry, and the bows were mostly horse-mounted archers. So there's sort of the quick shots, very yeah, accurate exactly. shots, and the cannons were more the destructive right. shots. Right, in the time that it took to load and fire one shot from a gun, you might get six shots mm-hmm. from a bow. They would complement each other really well. And what was the most common materials to be used? What is it some for void? the guns themselves? Yeah, I think that the barrels were mostly uh, bronze and iron, but I could be wrong about that. I, I think copper would have been too soft. I, I think eventually they all had to be steel, but mm-hmm. there could have been some early ones that were bronze. I wonder how the uh, first iron workers were told, "Hey, you need to make in this shape, this size, you know, this weight." Yeah, I don't know, like, uh, you know, chicken and egg, I don't know which would have been the first, but I know that there was a famous one that they talk about from the Siege of Constantinople, where it was Mm -hmm. just a really heavy cast piece. And, you know, a modern cannon, the bore takes up quite a bit of the total diameter because the steel is really strong, Mm -hmm. but you can tell they knew that their material wasn't that strong because if the pipe was a, a foot across, the ball was only maybe six inches. Really? Yeah, so they knew you had to get. You had play. really thick, thick walls mm-hmm. to them. And I mean, when you consider the fact that people had developed bells for churches and cathedrals, yeah. So they did have makers that could make these big molds. For sure, or... it was probably that. Yeah, the people who knew how to cast metal mm-hmm. would have been yeah. making bells and things like that. And I wonder how far some of these cannons traveled. You mean like how far the shot would go, or how far the cannons geographically? Moved yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Probably you know. pretty far because I think in the early days it would have been very limited, few specialists making it. And I think that the really big one from the Constantinople siege was cast in Dardanelles in, in Turkey. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so it wouldn't have gone too, too far to Constantinople. But for sure they would have used boats and carts and things like that. Like, it's not something people are walking around carrying. No, of course not. So you ask if if I was asking about the distance of the cannonballs, oh, so yeah. do you have some information on that? Not Did really. Did it travel I, kilometers? I or think just that meters? the range would have been similar to like catapults and stuff. So I think it would have all been line of sight. It wasn't like modern artillery where they're shooting it from 20 kilometers away. So probably hundreds of meters. There was a, a dance between how much explosive power can we use to make this thing go versus mm. how much will it take to blow up. And cannon. you don't want to waste all your gunpowder in one shot either. Well, yeah, you, you want to be efficient. You want to not blow up your cannon. <laughs> yes. We're probably the two main things. So it was very measured. Yeah, and I think that casting technology, while it was good, was, you know, it was still in its infancy. So I'm sure that there was a lot of cannons getting blown up by accident. In my own readings, I did hear of the king who was obsessed with cannons and he actually died by cannon. Which was... He got hit by shrapnel or something yes. like that? That's fitting. Well, the irony. I'd have to look up the dates. It's been a while since I've looked that up, but... I would imagine some of the leaders were very willing to use this technology. Oh, I'm sure. I think in general, you know, if you're a general and you want to win, you're not too fussy about, you know, what, what, what it using. takes to, to do that. And I think that the appeal of a cannon would have been pretty immediate, right? Because it's a a good psychological weapon, but it's also really effective. It's aggressive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that the Chinese used uh, gunpowder somewhat in war, but it was more as a distraction, more as, like, for the sound and for the fireworks, basically. So a good distraction tactic. But I don't think they really figured out how to use it as a genuinely destructive tool. Until much later. Until later on. Like, Mm -hmm. it was... We invented this cool thing and we're doing this and that with it, but it was the, the Middle East that turned it into a weapon, as far as I understand. Mm-hmm. And the gunpowder was made of what? Um, I forget the exact ingredients, but it's there's uh, I think it's phosphorus, nitrogen, and a few other things. I know that they used to collect bird droppings because there was naturally some, some materials in there. But it was a bit of a mad science at that time. Like, 
you know, you had to be a bit of a warlock or like <laughs> to, to mix it up. And I'm sure it would have been a closely guarded secret. You know, if you mm-hmm. if you know how to make gunpowder at that time, you know, that was like having a, a master's degree or something like that. <laughs> or maybe a doctorate even. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the alchemists were very important when they traveled. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, because mm-hmm. if you didn't have a good supply of it and know how to, uh, you know, keep, protect it, keep it dry, all that, mm-hmm. you know, you're not doing anything. You're going to blow up your own castle, you're possibly. Not, or you're just not going to have anything. Your, your guns aren't going to work. It's not like modern gunpowder, which is cordite or whatever they call it. Um, this stuff was very sensitive. Yeah, they must have had accidents along the way with yeah. just carrying it and learning how it For worked. sure. Both ends of it, you know, it, it could blow up when you don't want it to or it could not blow up mm-hmm. when you do want have it to. Have the misfires. I guess in rain it would probably have a different effect if it's humid. I think it basically the risk was it just wouldn't work at all. So I wonder if that's why maybe the, you know, the UK didn't use it as much for Yeah, a while. that's probably a good point. Like until you had methods to enclose and seal up and protect it from the elements, uh, it's it would a have been useless more, in Britain. <laughs> more usable in, you know, these these hotter des- dry. desert and arid mm. environments. Yeah, that's a good point. Not only that, but it's just, you know, it takes a while for technology to travel. But you're right, in the Scottish Highlands, it wouldn't be so practical. <laughs> Possibly not. Although they did have, you know, cannons, but it was a little later on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure there would have been lots of disappointment where, you know, oh no, our gunpowder got wet. Yeah. Although they were pretty good at making really solid casks. So, you know, yeah. maybe they were able to protect it in that way. <laughs> And their castles, uh, from the bigger castles like Sterling Edinburgh, they're, they're all built on a very high ground where, I mean, a volley of arrows could take down chunks of enemy. Right. So moving to a cannon is, while effective, you know, you're kind of catching them before, for the most part, they're coming up. Yeah, I guess you would have had to have really advanced cannons to be able to overcome... That the, angle. Yeah, that mm-hmm. angle, because... It's so much easier to shoot down, obviously. Yeah. yeah, gravity's on your side. Yeah, like you could have little tiny guns up on the wall that would shoot farther than the big guns down below. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. If ever you do visit Sterling, I know that the, um, uh, is it the ramparts? Like the... The, you mean the, the gate? No, sorry. Um, on top of the castle, you have the holes in between uh, the, the stone walls. Oh, you mean where they shoot from? Where they would shoot arrows prior, and then... They've widened them and cannons Put are cannons placed. through there. Uh, I forget the... I'm having a mental blank. I forget the name for those openings, mm-hmm. but I know what you mean. Yeah, They're like murder holes, but yeah, exactly. not quite the, the same. The murder holes were the ones facing down. Yeah. down. Yeah. <laughs> They're the, the side murder holes. I'm sure somebody will let me know what that is. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things. As soon as we're done, I'll remember it. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So the, the cannons were replacing this technology very slowly. But not that slowly, as we've pointed out. Yeah, it's like, you know, a couple hundred years sounds like a long time by a human... But in terms of human history, it's mm-hmm. the blink of an eye. Of course, of yeah. course. Yeah. And it was... I, I mean, what I thought was interesting about it is if you look at war from, you know, 3000 BC up until about maybe 1300, sure, there was some technological change, but, you know, somebody from ancient Troy or transported into the future into Mm -hmm. the year 1000 they would have felt relatively at home Mm -hmm. and known kind of what was going on iron kind of replaced bronze and this and that but you know was it a huge technological leap not really but if that same guy saw a cannon jumped a hundred years ahead Mm -hmm. well what 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 kind of (laughs) sorcery is that like what kind of magic some dragon in there exactly Mm -hmm. i'm really fascinated by the gunpowder and the cannon i mean that seems to be Two things that work really well together, but yet they're so separate on their own. Sure. The technologies are so different. Yeah. The skill set is so different. Right. The alchemy is very important for one. And for one, I mean, the metal alchemy is important, but you need the craftsmen. Yeah, metallurgy, I think, is is a little bit more of an evolution over time, whereas mm-hmm. I think the gunpowder, it, it would have been like one of those eureka moments like Mm -hmm. almost like the greek fire yeah it would have been more all of a sudden somebody mixes these things together accidentally and (laughs) And blows up something blows something up yeah Mm -hmm. and says wait a minute we can use all this energy to somehow yeah that was really the what caught me is obviously there was a long period of time where gunpowder was known about but to contain it and to do something useful with it and i always ask just for fun so if you had a time machine and i'll add to this point 
you're protected. You're not going to die unless you jump off a cliff. You know, so you're there to, to observe. observe. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I like modern plumbing and things. Like <laughs> yeah. That. No. Obviously. So. so let's take that out of the equation. But if you were able to just travel and sort of soak up that culture, what would be the time period or even an area that you'd be interested in? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, There's lots of good answers. So I mean, you can just pick one out of your favorites. It would probably be cool to see that siege of Constantinople because mm-hmm. I think it was just a significant city in its own right for all these different reasons and it would would be a really significant moment in history and I think it would probably be that. And do we understand all the movements concerning Constantinople? Because I mean, the records at that time would have been still fairly tricky on who's writing them and... Yeah, I mean, I, we probably don't. We probably don't. The, the old cliche, you know, was written by the winners. But yeah, you're right. It's like you don't really know. You don't really know. So to go back and see the military tactics and... Yeah, maybe it's a lot different than we understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing that shouldn't gloss over is like they were really outnumbered, you know? Mm -hmm. So maybe they didn't even really necessarily need the cannons. And both Mm -hmm. sides had cannons, by the way. But up until that point, they had been relatively small and the effectiveness was a lot less and, and... this was the first time that somebody really brought out the big gun, per se, and, and literally, <laughs> literally knocked the wall down. <laughs> and when they were able to breach the walls, that just changed history completely. Yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. I mean, you don't really see any fortified cities these days, and it's for a reason, because artillery is just going to shoot over it or shoot through it. Or... It doesn't really protect, even with you know the old style, older style of castles. Yeah, you could have eight rings of the best stone mm-hmm. there is, and they're all coming down. And when you consider how many man hours, how much cost there is, right. um, it's just not worth it. Yeah, you're point. better off defending your territory better. Mm-hmm. Not, Getting your not, own cannon. <laughs> not letting them get to you in the first place. Yeah, that's where the murder holes might have been a little more effective. Well, and if you think about it, it's like we still use cannons. It's just modern day artillery. They, you know, they can just shoot so much farther and so much better. But it's the same idea. It's a, a big metal tube that you shoot stuff out of. Mm-hmm. And we did a podcast, The History of Tanks. Right. And that's essentially right, just a tank, moving cannon. Yeah, tanks or cannons <laughs> yeah. on wheels, uh, yeah. you know, or tracks or, or both. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's, sure. it's got a similar feel to it. But let's say that's part of the modern cannon in warfare now. Yeah, it's true. And, uh, you know, on that topic, it, it there was a real, you know, leap of evolution too, right? Like the Germans just came on the scene and made American tanks look like they didn't have a gun at all. And so if you move along, we've had, you know, the 1400s-ish and then the 1500s-ish. How did that progress a little later? I mean, that's a good question. I don't really know exactly. I mean, I know more about in the modern era. Okay, uh, so let's jump ahead a little bit. Well, you went from having where you load everything through the bore to breech-loaded, where you open up the back of the thing and stuff in things from the back, right? Made it quicker. Mm-hmm. And then eventually you got to the point where you were pre-packaging a round that you could just pop in and everything would all come in a cartridge. And that, Almost like a bullet. That That is the modern mm-hmm. way, right? So there was a slow change from one to the other. So the engineering developed rapidly enough. I mean, that's only a few hundred years, really. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, if you look at the totality of you know history, it, it happened mostly in the last 500 years. And then you think of guns these days. I mean, that's just beyond what... Yeah, I mean, with modern like, guns, in a hundred years, it went, mm-hmm. they went crazy. So we're going to have lasers like in Star Trek at some point. Yeah, or just yeah. some kind of sound weapon that just <laughs> zaps you with sound. Yeah, who knows where we're going to go in a few hundred years. Hopefully peacefully. And your little tidbit that you shared. Oh, you, yeah. <laughs> I so, found that really so fascinating. So Rosie has a, a little questionnaire that you do before you come on the podcast. And she said, is there I give you homework, sorry. Is there, is there anything interesting about you? And uh, I said, well, you know what, it kind of relates to this whole gunpowder thing, so mm-hmm. it jumped to my head. But um, yeah, my, my mom is a Hatfield, and she's related to the, you know, the Hatfields and the McCoys. And uh, you know, th- what they're most famous for was their family feuds and, and as basically shooting each other. In what location? Uh, in Kentucky and West Virginia and mm-hmm. stuff. So, um, you know, obviously this would be much more modern gunpowder yes. and things mm-hmm. like that. More but, during the American Revolution, probably. Um, so mostly after that, but okay. um, before the Civil War. Because by the okay. time the Civil War happened, I think it was more toned down. It was more over. But yeah, my mom's family is uh, famous in that way. So they did use cannons. 
Uh, I, I, or gunpowder, at they least. They definitely <laughs> shot guns all kinds. I don't know if anyone technically would have used a, a cannon, but um, they definitely had all kinds of um, you know, muzzle loaders, which would almost like a, a hand cannon that you mm-hmm. would go hunting with. And uh, they also had some more modern guns like the Colt revolvers where, you know, with those you would have cartridges loaded up, ready to go. And um, I think occasionally dynamite, you know, got got used. But that wasn't technically gunpowder. That's uh, like nitroglycerin and Mm, sawdust. It's a different type of explosion. TNT, they call it, right? Mm -hmm. I guess, uh, you know, my interest in gunpowder... Is hereditary? It's partly hereditary, (laughs) at least, yeah. And and when I was a little kid, I actually learned how to shoot guns from my grandfather. I think I was four or five. That sounds safe. Yeah. (laughs) No, I'm sure with the proper... You know, to be honest, like, there was some stuff that was less safe, like, you know... You wouldn't consider doing that with your son right now. (laughs) Probably not. No. (laughs) Like, I remember one time we found an old Canada WD-40, and I said, you know, Grandpa, is it okay if I shoot it? He said, yeah, it's fine. Just, we'll stand behind this tree and, (laughs) you know, just poke your head out a little Mm -hmm. bit. But uh, all's well that ends well. I still have all my, my ditches. <laughs> Nothing blew stuff. off yeah. yet. <laughs> yeah. um, if ever you get a chance, we went to, on a family trip to Kingston. And at Fort Henry, you actually can pay a, a, have a ticket to shoot a Snyder Enfield rifle. Oh, really? Yes. That'd be fun. It was really fun. And somebody shows you how to do it. You, you get three blanks, you know, but it still has the kickback. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, I always enjoy guns. Um, I, I like shooting and stuff, but I just don't really get a chance here because, you know, in in Kentucky, obviously, it's a lot less restrictive. And, mm-hmm. and in all Canada, my, it's different. All my yeah. relatives have guns. My uncle here in Canada is a, a, an avid hunter, mm. but we just don't, you know, spend that much time with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my wife is really anti-gun, so she's made it clear, like, there right. won't be any in yeah. this house, right? And that's okay. I mean, you can join gun ranges later on. Yeah. And when your children are older, it's... Yeah. yeah, but for me, it is kind of important that at some point, you know, my kids learn how to shoot and stuff like that. But I, I'm, you know, happy wife, happy life. I'm not going <laughs> to push it too hard. I'm going to well, have to find awesome, a way. Well, she's pretty so... <laughs> yeah, I'll have to find a way. I'm sure when the kids are older and they show their own interest in the history and the family... That and... might be it. Or I might just have to take them down to Kentucky. Oh, there you go. That works too. Yeah. <laughs> a little excuse for a family trip down exactly. there. Exactly. Go see some family. And if ever you do go to Fort Henry, you might have a chance to sneak that box. Yeah, true. Historical guns can be neat because you don't necessarily get access to, to stuff no, like that. No, exactly. Exactly. And they have a whole range. I mean, their, their museum is really great. When my grandfather was still around, he had um, an M1, which is an old military gun, and I got to shoot that. And what was fun about it is, you know, they have the little cartridge, and when you when you do fire off the last shot, it, it, it makes this weird metallic, like, pinging sound as it shoots the empty thing out. Uh, you know, I was thinking to myself, like, what a horrible military gun. It, like, announces to <laughs> everyone around you that you're empty. Yeah, yeah it made this weird, like, ping sound as it, as it was empty, and it's like, oh... Imagine being the soldier, you just think to yourself, like, oh, Although, God. in a war, I mean, would you really hear that ping? Only if it was a smaller thing, like... The, I mean, I've only seen movies. I've obviously never been yeah, in Yeah, in a large-scale battle, no one would know. No I don't think so, care. no. But, but if, you would know, which if, is a good but thing. But if you're, you know, holed up with a sniper in a church yeah, or something no. like that, and, uh, you know, you're the last two standing, it's not going to be a good scene. <laughs> or like, uh, you know, Saving Private Ryan or something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, you definitely don't want to be in that situation. So I guess your knowledge of gunpowder is not just cannons, but some different rifles also. Yeah, again, I'm not an expert, but I, I do know a bit about this stuff, and I, and I find it interesting. Yeah, and I mean, as hopefully I've mentioned before too, I'm not looking just for academics. I honestly just want to do the passion part of the project. Right. Yeah, it's, it's about getting people interested in mm-hmm. history and, and, you know... Looking it up and... Having I, fun out with it. I yeah, think. and I will be finding a book, uh, a book suggestion with this, so that will definitely be added to the podcast. Yeah, that sounds great. But yeah, I look forward powder. to it, and I wouldn't mind reading some new stuff about it. Like, it's hard to find time, you know, now that I'm older and career and children. kids and yeah. everything, but uh, I, I definitely always enjoy learning more about it. About history. I feel like your your passions when you're younger still pop up. Yeah. As you get older, you just find different ways to keep going with the passion. For sure. And that's why I did a history degree. You know, people used to always say, oh, you want to be a teacher? This and that. No, I just wanted to study something that I found interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's funny because like now I sell cars, so the history degree doesn't help with that per se. But I still enjoy doing it. And at the end of the day, you know, a lot of times if it's an undergrad degree, 
it's just about finishing and, and getting it done. And it's the skills you learn along the way too. Yeah, learning how to write essays. You know, mm-hmm. I can write a mean email now with a, <laughs> done ten thousand page essays or mm-hmm. ten thousand word essays rather or about gunpowder regimes. Yeah. <laughs> Don't put that in your client emails. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a bad idea. I had written a paper about this stuff and I had all my textbooks, but this was like fifteen years ago, so all of this is pretty much just off the top of my head. Well, it's a good memory. Most people don't remember what they did 15 years ago. So. Yeah, and I probably don't remember <laughs> what I did 10 minutes ago, but yeah. for some reason I remember this stuff. Do you remember any cool tidbits during your courses, even um, a warfare story or a tactic that you found interesting in your studies? I can't really think of a specific example. I just think that you know it was really neat that these cultures were doing so much with firearms at a time that's pretty much forgotten. When we learned about history in school, it was always about you know, the French Revolution and the U.S. Revolution and and things like that. So, you know, obviously cannons and and muskets everywhere, but there was no... Was the precursor, right? Exactly. Like, it was a jump from, you know, knights in armor and Mm -hmm. all that to what happened in between. And Mm -hmm. I guess the reason why they leave it out is because it's not Europeans that are doing the the innovation. True. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, Joe, thank you so much for taking the time. I know your schedule is really oh, busy, pleasure. so and I really appreciate it. Oh, it was, it was a pleasure. And I wish that, like I said, I wish I knew more of the, the details. I wish I could give more. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. <laughs> it's pretty incredible that Joe has remembered this years after he finished his thesis. The book recommendations today are both nonfiction. The first one would be Early Gunpowder Artillery, 1300 to 1600 by John Norris. And the second one would be Saltpeter, The Mother of Gunpowder by David Cressy. I'll definitely have that in the show notes. Don't forget, you can find me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at History A. And it would be fantastic if you could rate me on your podcasting platform of choice. It helps people find me. So I really appreciate your help. And of course, I want to thank my husband, Jamie, our brood of kids, our family, our friends. Without them, I wouldn't be adventuring through history. Un grand merci.